if my memory serves me correctly, I was somewhere around the age of five or six where I first remembered, and that hadn't been that too long ago, folks. So, for six, when I remember on Sunday afternoons coming home from church, having a big dinner, like many of you probably grew up with, and then loading up in an old, it must have been a 58, 59 Ford station wagon. I just remember it was a Ford because it was the only Ford my father owned. And if he had known I'd ever owned one, he probably would have come up out of his grave. But in any way, we had an old Ford station wagon that stayed in the shop more than it stayed in the road. And we would pile up in that station wagon, my two sisters, myself, my mom, and my dad, and we would travel across town and pick up my dad's mom and dad. And we would ride out into what I call the country. And I was a city guy. I mean, there was at least 5,000 people in our town. So, I mean, I lived in the town limits. But in, we would ride out to the country, an area much like here that we live in here at Green Pond, and visit my dad's cousins and aunts and uncles and would sit on the front porch and I can remember the iced tea would be being drank, and I would be sitting there at six years old listening to conversations about Uncle John and Aunt Sue and Cousin Bob and all the rest who I'd never met, never knew, and didn't know anything about them, and at that point didn't care to know anything about them. My only concern was why somebody couldn't pick up a football and go outside and play with me with that. So I would just sit there. It seemed like hours. I'm sure it wasn't, but it seemed like hours. Basically, what I got was a history course in my family lineage or a genealogy. And for genealogies, we all know, unless they concern us, they're pretty boring. We don't care about them. We don't, wanna, we don't want to spend the time trying to decipher who's who in a genealogy. So, with that being the case, this Christmas, our children, one of the gifts they gave to Danita and me were... Uh, subscription to one of the genealogy things online and in a nice way they didn't say it specifically but they said we know you're getting old and you're interested in those types of things and they're right I am interested in those types of things and can't wait to get started on it but for genealogies most of the time it's insignificant stuff it's considered boring unfortunately the genealogies in scripture especially in Genesis for many times many of us modern day Christians skip over those it's just a lot of names I don't know how to pronounce. I don't know anybody named that name, and I don't really care about it. But those genealogies are so crucial. The genealogy in chapter 5 that we've already talked about, where it connects Adam to Noah. And then we're going to see today in chapter 10 and a little bit next week in chapter, or in the next couple of weeks in chapter 11, the same, another type of genealogy that connects Noah to Abraham. Why is that important? Because Abraham is connected to whom? To the nation of Israel. He is the father of the nation of Israel. And then he is connected to King David, who is connected to Jesus Christ our Lord, which is, connects all of us. That's why it's important to us, folks. And the writer of this genealogy, Moses, the prophet Moses, he, he knows that and he's writing to mainly the nation of Israel when he writes this, the Hebrew people. Showing them the connection like an old grandfather would. To showing our great-grandfather, trying to show his grandchildren or great-grandchildren, this is who you are. This is your guts. This is your substance. This is what you're made of. This is your bloodline. These are the people that you came from. How you have life. Surely God creates us. But who God used to bring you into this world. And that's significant for all of us. The good, the bad, and the ugly of it. And surely in these genealogies, we see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're going to see more and more of that. The ugliness in God's family. In His chosen people. In His chosen family. Which just goes to show us again God's infinite mercy. And God's infinite grace. That is so apparent in our salvation. So we're going to, to begin dissecting this in chapter 10. We won't take time to read every name in it, but we are going to read particular ones in these first 20 verses. We'll talk more about the specifics of that in just a moment.
But if we could, let's go to God in prayer as we prepare our hearts to hear because I can promise you this. Number one, it's God's Word. And number two, it is relevant to us today. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank You for, again, this time of worship and what we've already enjoyed, Lord, with singing of the words of the cross and Your blood and all that You have provided for us, all that You have given us, God, all of Your great goodness to us. And Lord, I pray now that as we open Your Word and read it and we hear these names, we hear the connections of the family members and the people, that You will show us how we are connected, God. How we are connected not only to them, but most importantly, God, to You. That we are recipients of that blood that was shed for our redemption that we have been singing about this morning. And may you use these words, your words, God, to change our hearts and draw, our close, draw us closer to you. We pray this in the blood-soaked name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First, a little background in biblical genealogies. There's mainly two types, really any genealogy. But you have a linear genealogy, which we've seen before in chapter 5, and we'll see again in chapter 11, and we see in Matthew's Gospel, where one, one name or one line is taken to show a connection from way back here to all the way to here. In the case of, of Adam to Jesus, okay, like in Matthew's genealogy. We see it, that's called a linear genealogy. And then you have a segmented genealogy, which is more of a family tree. You take all the children of this man, of this forefather, and you see how all of them branched out. And that's what this is in chapter 10. It's a segmented genealogy, more of a family tree of Noah. And what that does, and why that's important, it shows a segmented genealogy is used to show alliances, not just between peoples and families and clans, but nations. Because here is the great truth, folks. Remember, let's go back. I know it's been in time. It's been several weeks. But it's just been a couple of verses in, in, in actuality in Scripture. But in chapter 6 through 9, we talked about the flood. God forecasted the flood coming. Everything in man's heart was evil. I'm going to destroy it except for save eight people, Noah and his family. And when the flood receded and God told, commanded Noah to come out, what was his command to him? The same command as he gave Adam. That's right. Some of you are saying it. Be fruitful and multiply. You had Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. And that was the population of the earth. That's not a biblical folk tale. That's history, folks. That was the population of the earth. And so what God did was replenish the earth through Noah and his family. That's very important to understand. That's why that connection in chapter 5 from Adam to Noah is crucial. That's what connects us to Adam. That's why that sin gene, the depravity that we have because we're fallen, because we're an ancestor of Adam, we're an ancestor of Noah, we're an ancestor of Moses, we're an ancestor of Abraham. And all of that flows to us. That, that's very important to understand. So we had this, this genealogy we see at the end of chapter 9. Okay, This is where Noah pronounces the curse. Remember the context of this. Noah the, was beginning to replenish the earth and he was a vine dresser and, and had a vineyard and he took from the fruit of the vine and drank from it and he overindulged, right? Scripture says that he was naked and drunk, laying in his dwelling naked and drunk. His first son came in, the first son came in Ham and saw him. And it was a dishonoring. A lot, we've talked about this a little bit. But there's a lot of speculation about what was the sin that was pinned on Ham. It was his dishonoring his father. There was no sexual sin there. There was no homosexual activity or anything because of the language that was used. And the language that's used for those types of sin is totally different in the Hebrew. And that's why it was just simply he dishonored his father. He saw his father laying naked and drunk and just fall down drunk. So what did he do? He dishonored him by doing what? By going and telling his brothers. Sham and Japheth. And said, hey, look, the old man is plastered in there. 
Look at him. He's laying naked. Mocking his father. Sham and Japheth grab a cloth and back up to their father and put the cloth on him and show honor. And when Noah awakens, this is what he says. Cursed be Canaan. We'll get to who Canaan is in just a moment. A servant of servants shall be shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now, Canaan is going to be Noah's grandson. He is a descendant of Ham. So the curse was on Ham, but more specifically Canaan. Now that name, if you have studied the Bible at all over the years, that name should ring a bell. Canaan, the land of Canaan. We know that is the promised land. That's what God promises Abraham in just a few chapters that he will inherit. It will be the chosen land flowing with milk and honey for whom? For his chosen people. For his family. But yet... Noah right here pronounces a curse on that. So we want to see where this goes. We want to look what we're going to see real quickly in this first part of this chapter today is the blessing and curse, mainly the curse, what biblically that curse is. Not a curse like somebody may try to pass down today or something in some uh, false religion or something like that, but a biblical curse because it's real because we read those words in chapter 9. And we see the fruition of it as it comes to fruition in chapter 10. So we see first of all in, in, in chapter 10 verses 1 through 5, we see verse 1. These are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. These are the, pe these are the three sons that repopulated the world. Chronologically, this probably is written after chapter 11. We're going to get to chapter 11. We know that is the Tower of Babel and where, the, where God dispersed all the people. Well, right here, we're seeing where they were dispersed from. God populated the earth because He sent the people into these areas. We'll see later in a few weeks specifically why He sent them there. But this is what is happening here. So he, first He talks about Japheth. And Japheth was given a blessing, not like Shem, but he was basically his territory would be enlarged. May, may, may Ham and Canaan and his descendants live in his tents. In other words, and when it goes through and it lists the different areas, the coastline and all that, we know that in what is the Indo-European area. What became all of Europe and the, uh, and the part of Asia we know as India, that is basically came out of the descendants of Japheth. So that, what that does for us, that shows the faithfulness of God when, when Noah uses God's name and says, may his territory be enlarged, may his area be expanded, that's a pretty big area. <laughs> that's a prominent part of the world and where many of our descendants have come in, in that Indo-European area. And so that is, that's what he, he mentions there in the first five. Not a lot said about that. Then we go, we go down to... Uh, Verse 6, and that gets to Ham, verses 6 through 20. Again, we won't read all of that right now. I would encourage you to read that and you get home, but let me just read verse 6. The sons of Ham, and here they are, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. We know names right there, do we not? If we've read the Bible at all, Egypt and Canaan, both enemies of God's family, right? Both enemy of the people of God. And we're going to see, wait, wait a minute, you just said Canaan was the promised land. Yes, but in the beginning, Canaan was the enemy. And we'll see that as we go down through here. Uh, in verse, verse 8, a name that you should know and his description you'll know. Verse 8 from other verses in Genesis. Cush fathered Nimrod. Nimrod, he was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. Remember the mighty man? It's so controversial in chapter 6 where we talk about the sons of God and the daughter of man and is, were, the, were the mighty men, were they descendants? And we talked about how, at least my opinion is, no, they were not the descendants. Moses was saying this occurred, this, the sons of Satan and the daughters of men, the, those, they joined together sexually 
And it was during the time of the mighty men. This is something the Hebrew people would have known about because they're living during this time. And so Nimrod was one of these mighty men. Now what were the mighty men? They were great warriors. They were very aggressive. They were going to get revenge. They were counter to everything God's law taught. They were evil, even though it mentions uh, before the Lord here in verse 9. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, the predecessor to Babylon, which will be a great enemy to God's people. This is where God is going to disperse them in chapter 11 in the Tower of Babel. So we, we see this, this name of Nimrod here. We go down to verse 11 and 12. We're going to bring all this together, folks. I know it's a little tedious, but it's very important that we understand. Go to verse 11. From that land, he, talking about Nimrod, went into Assyria and built Nineveh. Now we, immediately you should think of Jonah, the prophet Jonah being sent into Nineveh. And Jonah put up a fight against God, remember? Why did he not want to go into Nineveh and preach the gospel? Because they were enemies to God's people. They had done horrible things. They would be very similar to us like in Iraq or North Korea. Somebody that believed exactly the opposite of what we believe. That's what Nineveh was to Israel, to the Hebrew people. And just why Jonah put up such a fight. He didn't want them to be blessed. <laughs> he didn't want them to be saved. They were his enemy. And that is where they, this is where they sprang forth. From Nimrod. We see that in Nineveh, and we mention, he mentions Assyria down below there. Those are the Assyria was one of the empires that God used to put his children in exile, right? To punish them in the Old Testament. It was, a, it was a foreign nation, it was not a believing nation, but God used them to put discipline on his people. And all this flows out of the son of Noah, Ham, and Noah's grandson. Canaan. No one, no, excuse me. Noah's grandson Canaan. And that's where it gets to. We go down to uh, go to verse 15. Canaan fathered Sidon and the firstborn and, and Heath, Heth and the Jebusites, the Amurites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zemurites, and the Hamorites. All of those names in there, the main one is Amorites. Every time throughout Old Testament history, it is mentioned with the Canaanites as the enemy of Israel, the enemy of God, the enemy of God. And we even go to uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. And they should, this is God's covenant with Abraham. Okay, we'll be to in a few weeks in chapter 15 of Genesis. And God tells Abraham, you're going to grow to a ripe old age. You're going to be the father of many nations. And then verse 16, And they shall come back here, meaning his descendants, in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Listen to this, folks. God will punish wickedness. God may not do it in my time and your time. He may not do it in your lifetime or my lifetime. But God will punish. He will judge and punish all wickedness even if it's in the day of the final judgment. Even here it wasn't in the day of the final judgment, but it was far off. Many generations passed before he dealt with the Amorites. And he told Abraham, you won't see me deal with them. You're not going to see the promised land, but your descendants will, and they will be dealt with. We see Deuteronomy chapter 7 addresses this. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, if you want to write down that reference. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 3. This is again going back to Noah's curse on Canaan. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, this is Moses preaching to the nation of Israel right before he dies. Deuteronomy is just a series of Moses' sermons. Warning them to remember the law, remember your disobedience, don't do it again, which they didn't listen to, but warning them before they occupy, before Joshua leads them into the promised land. And he says in chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, which will be Canaan, that you are entering to take possession of, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, 
Seven nations that are mentioned right here in the genealogy in chapter 10. God tells them He's going to wipe them out. But listen to how He describes them. Here's what I want you to hear. Seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. God picked little old Israel. He picked the little old weak nation of Israel. Why? So that He could show His glory. That's important to understand, folks. He's not looking for the biggest and baddest and the best. He has used sinful, broken men and women throughout Scripture to bring His glory, to manifest His glory. He does it with the nation of Israel. I am going to destroy all seven of these people that are all bigger than you and stronger than you. But I will get rid of them. You say, well, that doesn't sound like a loving God. Well, it is a loving God because He's a holy God and He will not tolerate wickedness. And that's what He does. He totally destroys them. Verse 2, And when the Lord your God gives them over to you, because I'm the one doing it, God says, I'm giving them over to you, and you defeat them, you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them, and you shall show them no mercy. You shall not intermarry with them. You shall not do anything. Get rid of them, destroy them. Why? Because they will take you down the wrong road. How does God know this? Because they've already done it. And they will do it again, unfortunately, through all the kings of Israel. But God is saying, this is my standard and I'm not going to compromise. And this is what we see in that line of Ham, what, what, what Noah pronounces in chapter 9, at the end of chapter 9, the curse on Ham, the curse on Canaan. And that was... They were outside the covenant. The covenant is going to be formed with God. They were outside of that. And we know, but God had a plan, did He not? Because with Abraham, we're going to see, I will bless you, I'll make you the father of many nations. And what? Bless all the nations of the world through you. He will bring some of them back into the fold because of His goodness, because of His grace. Here's, here's what I want us to hear, folks to make sure we understand God will bring judgment in His time. Just because what is we don't think we're getting justice right now, or that God's people aren't getting justice, God will bring justice in His time. It is not our place to bring justice. God is the judge. He will bring justice. And He will bring it in His timing. And it may be in another generation after us, we may never see the fruit of that, ultimately. But we all will see it, ultimately, on Judgment Day. And we see that in the case of Canaan, as it took generation after generation after generation for them to be brought to justice and God obliterate them. The great reformer John Calvin said this about this chapter in, in, in Canaan and, and the whole history of that. This second commencement of mankind, that's what he calls it, because that's what Noah was, was it not? The whole earth was populated from those eight people. Every nation in the world. The commencement of mankind is especially worthy to be known and detestable in the ingratitude of those with which they have heard from their fathers and grandfathers of the wonderful restoration of the world in so short a time. Hear that, folks the wonderful restoration of the world from their grandfathers. They, they detest that. They threw that away. A genealogy, the history of a family. Biblical history that we turn our nose up because we say it's boring. Those are names I don't understand. We need to relish and understand what God did. He cleansed an earth with the flood of all wickedness. And with His graciousness, allowed man to repopulate it. Commanded man to repopulate. Why? Because we are all created in God's glory. And that shows His glory when the earth is full of people. Because we're image bearers of God. Regardless of our race, creed, or color, or even our religious affiliation. Even a Muslim, the very person of a Muslim or a Buddhist or any other false religion, they, their presence glorifies God because they're image bearers of God. They're created in His image. And it is the responsibility of the church to go forth and take the gospel so that that glory might be filled completely when they are converted and redeemed by Jesus Christ. 
What a great plan. What a great big plan God has had before the foundations of the earth. And it's important that we understand that every piece of it is important. Every part is important. This curse, that word, that, that's, that gets into witchcraft and things we don't not crazy about, but it is a biblical term. And folks, we are all under a curse. We are all under a curse. If you go back to Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve fell in the garden and God doled out the punishment, we see in verse 24 of Genesis 3, He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, He placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The, the curse is we are separated from a holy God. We were created to be in fellowship with Him. But the curse, because of our sin, we are eternally separated from God. Except for those passages like Ephesians 4 2. Excuse me, Ephesians 2 4. But God. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. We were following the passions of our flesh. But God. He intervened because of His great mercy. That's why we can sit here today and worship Him. That's why we can come in just a few moments and worship Him through the Lord's Supper and do it in remembrance of what He has done and how He's redeemed us. Paul says it so well in Galatians 3. Galatians 3 verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Because the law is a curse. Why? Because our nature made it was un, impossible for us to keep the law. Because our nature is to sin and to violate the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Folks, that is what Jesus Christ did. The tree, the cross of Jesus Christ. That is quoted back from the Old Testament before crucifixion was even a part of the world environment. But God so inspired the writers to know how He would bring redemption. He would do it on the most horrific death known to man. And that was on a cross. On a tree. To be nailed on it. And not only those nails and the, the crown of thorns, but the wrath that God poured out on Jesus Christ. He cursed His Son by putting Him on a tree so that you and I might have eternal life. He took, as we've already sung about many times this morning, He took the wrath. He took the pain. He took the judgment and the punishment for our sin. Because all sin is going to be judged. If you're in Christ this morning, you can praise God because it was judged on a cross 2,000 years ago. There will be no more judgment for you if you're in Christ Jesus. But if you're not the wrath of God remains on you and will be poured out on you in excess for eternity if we do not repent. That is the message of the cross. That is the message of God's Word. That is the message of His genealogy and His curse on Ham and Canaan. And that is why we come this morning as followers of Christ to revel in this, the, the sacrifice that He made for us. I want to pray for us and then we're going to stand and read our covenant and partake of the Lord's Supper. Let me pray for us. Father, thank You for Your Word. We thank You that it has been kept holy all these years, all this time. That the, even the meticulous details to names and families and genealogies have a place, God, in our life today because it connects us to the Savior of the world that we are physically part of You, that we are Your family. And Lord, we come this day to celebrate that and partaking for all those that are baptized believers to come and partake of the Lord's Supper and to remember what You have done for us and to look forward to when You come again, when we will be taken home with You to the marriage supper of the land and live with You in eternity. We pray this. And thank you for this, God, in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I want to ask you now to stand.
if you're able, and we and you take your covenant. We want to uh, read this in unison together. I, again, as I said before, we're not a a people of a lot of creeds and liturgy, and sometimes it's a little awkward. But we want to read this and understand this is affirming our covenant with Jesus Christ as being His child, and our covenant with each other as members of Green Pine Baptist Church. Having been led by the Spirit of God, by divine grace, to repent of our sins and believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we do now in the presence of God in this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into this covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We commit, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to not forsake the assembling together of ourselves for worship and prayer, to work in unity in the bond of peace, to sustain the ordinances, doctrines, and discipline, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, and to relieve the poor, to evangelism of our neighbors and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We commit to watch over one another in brotherly love through prayer, to make sure there's no need among us, to rejoice in each other's joys, and to bear each other's burdens with tenderness and sympathy, to warn, admonish, encourage, and rebuke as needed, but slow to take offense, quick to forgive, and always ready to be reconciled. We commit by divine aid to deny ungodliness and every worldly lust and to pursue holy and righteous living for the glory of Jesus Christ, who has delivered us out of darkness into His marvelous light. We moreover commit that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with another true gospel church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's Word. I thank you for that. You may be seated. <clears throat>